Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, where we are taking a look at a British World War I sniper rifle. This is a Lee Enfield with a scope on it. And there isn't a designation for it really, because the British actually didn't have a formal standardized, like pattern recognized sniper rifle until 1918. So, uh, they didn't go into World War I with any sort of optically sighted infantry rifle. That, I mean, sniping really is quite unsportsmanlike, and not the sort of thing that the British Army of 1914 was likely to be doing. So the British were actually kind of a bit taken by surprise when the Germans started bringing out a lot of scoped rifles. Uh, and the British started suffering this rash of head injuries that they... it took them a little while to figure out exactly what was going on. But it turns out it was snipers. Now, the number of casualties they were taking from this wasn't really that big in the grand scheme of things. You know, compared to the just unimaginable numbers of men who were being vaporized by artillery and laid out by machine guns, the occasional sniper rifle casualty, eh, numbers-wise, not that big a deal. However, it was a serious impediment to morale and to movement. Uh, just the, the idea that there might be a sniper out there, or when you knew there was a sniper out there, it got a lot harder to move around the trenches. So this was something that had to be, uh, had to be combated. And so the British started a program of developing and issuing their own sniper rifles to counter the threat. At the very beginning, this took, this took the form of basically whatever they could scrounge from the civilian market. A lot of hunting rifles, Mausers, Monlickers, you know, commercially available stuff. However, in 1915, the British Army, or the British government, uh, started issuing contracts for actual SMLE rifles with optics on them. Now, they would issue these contracts to like nine different companies to convert rifles to sniper configuration. They would use a wide variety of scopes, basically anything they were able to get their hands on. The most common ones were the ones made by uh, Aldous Brothers, the Parismatic Prism Company, and that's what we have here, and also Winchester. Um, in fact, they used Winchester A5 and Winchester B4 scopes on a bunch of these rifles. So like I said, there was no formal designation. This was, get some scopes, we'll give you some rifles, and mount the scopes on the rifles and send them over, and we'll put them to good use. So there was a variety of configurations of magnifications. The most typical was a three or four power scope. Uh, early in the war there were a lot of offset scopes, which allows you to continue to use the stripper clip guide in the rifle, as well as the original iron sights, and keeps the scope a little bit lower. But of course everything is a trade-off, and this is a lot less, uh, less suited to really good accurate marksmanship. It's much better to have the scope centered over the bore. This also potentially brings up some issues shooting through small loopholes. Like, you can't have a loophole just wide enough for the rifle muzzle. It's got to be about twice as big so that you can actually see uh, through the loophole with the scope as well. Or else you end up with that classic bore offset problem of modern rifles like ARs, where your optic is higher than your, bore, than your muzzle, and so you end up occasionally accidentally shooting barricades or barriers because you can see over the top and you don't think about the fact that the barrel's below. Well, same thing can happen with an offset scope. No, I can see through this loophole, and you fire a shot and realize you just, you know, shot the steel plate six, is, six inches in front of the muzzle because the muzzle wasn't actually sticking through the loophole. Anyway, I am starting to digress a bit. Uh, let me go ahead and show you exactly what this scope and mount are like, because this will give you some definite appreciation for modern optics. The rifle itself here is a completely standard number one Mark III Star Lee Enfield. These weren't these were chosen for accuracy, but they were not specifically made uh, for scoped use for sniper conversion. Just standard off the rack guns. This particular one is an Enfield 1917 production, so S H T L E three star, short Lee Enfield number three star. The scope is, I believe, a three power. It is remarkably clear for today, which is really nice. Um, it does have a serial number and a patent date on it. V1796, and a patent there. 1915 was the date of the patent on the scope. The mounting bracket is really pretty simple. It's a female dovetail that has been screwed with no less than five screws onto the side of the receiver, uh, and the surface underneath, the joint there between the mount and the receiver, is also soldered in place. 
You can see here where those uh, screw holes were drilled into the inside of the receiver. And then it has a spring-loaded catch right here, which allows the scope to be removed. Uh, this particular one is shimmed in place, presumably for accuracy, and so I don't want to actually take it off. But uh, you can see how that was done. It's just a little checkered pad. Being able to remove the scope is a pretty common thing in World War I, and much later even. Uh, scopes were relatively fragile, and rifles were generally treated fairly roughly. And so if you weren't actually using the scope, you'd take it off the gun, put it in a protective case, and, and well, take better care of it. We do have a few actual controls here at the front end of the scope, uh, which is more than you sometimes get on early military snipers. This is actually a focal adjustment which is kind of cool, a little bit unique, a little distinct from what we get in today's optics. This is your bullet drop compensator, so that's your elevation adjustment. You would use that both for, uh, for zeroing, for, wind, for elevation, and also for compensating for range. On the front here is just a little set screw used to lock it down. When we loosen that, we can then rotate this guy. You'll see it's marked from 1 through 6, that's in hundreds of meters. Uh, and what this does is actually move your reticle up and down. So it doesn't actually... doesn't adjust the whole scope, it just moves the reticle in your field of view. So you set it to wherever you want it, you can then just finger tighten that down, which prevents this from moving. Then these two adjustments are actually your windage adjustments. You are not using those to compensate for actual wind for a given shot. You're using those to zero the scope, and that is it. So you shim up the, uh, the mount to make sure it's nice and tight, and then I believe this is a thing where you, you loosen one and tighten the other, and you're shifting the whole mechanism inside the, the scope tube back and forth. So really, uh, we have a very... We, we are spoiled today by having simple click-adjustable windage knobs. So there's your reticle. You have a post in the center, and then a horizontal crosshair. If I adjust the elevation, you can see that sliding up and down. And then, I don't know if I can do this, but we'll give it a try. If I adjust the focus... Is it going to... yep, there you go. You can see that go out of focus. This is a little complicated because the camera's focus is fighting with the scopes. But uh, you get the idea there. In total, during World War I, the British military would issue out about 10,000 scoped sniper rifles. Uh, both SMLEs like this one, and also Pattern 1914 rifles. The Pattern 1914, with a Parismatic Prism Company center-mounted scope, would by 1918 prove to be the best all-around package for a British sniper rifle, and that would be formally adopted as, as the standard uh, in 1918, and that's what was used after the war. But during the war, whole mishmash of stuff. Um, about 50% of what was issued out during the war, 4,830, uh, rifles were Parismatic Prism Company scopes mounted on guns in various ways. So what you see here is really the most common... the closest thing there was to a standard British sniper rifle during the war. Uh, most of these were scrapped out after the war. Uh, in 1921 they were declared obsolete in favor of that uh, P-14 center-mounted scope pattern. Uh, and at that point, any of these that were still uh, with units were to be turned in and replaced with P-14 rifles. Uh, the army requirement dropped from 10,000 to about 3,000 to equip the peacetime army. So uh, like with all World War I original sniper rifles, these are pretty scarce. So we've taken a look at some of the others. Um, I have previous videos on, in fact, one of those 1918 pattern guns. Definitely check that out if you're interested in this sort of thing. I also have a video on one of the World War I German Gewehr 98 snipers, as well as some American uh, World War I snipers. So a bunch of other stuff you can take a look at if you're interested. If you collect sniper rifles, or British rifles, or Enfields, and you would like to have this one in your own collection, take a look at the description text below the video. You'll find a link there to Forgotten Weapons, and from there you can click over to Rock Island's catalog page on this rifle. You can take a look at their description, their high-res pictures, their price estimate, all that sort of good stuff. Thanks for watching.